Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear me. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking today about my experiences caring for a loved one with Huntington disease. His name was Michael. Now, in particular, we're talking about the problems I faced as his partner, accepting the changes in Michael and how we adjusted our lives accordingly. I hope my words can provide some information how we continued our relationship as this cruel condition progressed over our last few years together. I was working full-time as an aged care coordinator in West End, just down the road from the Boundary Pub, where Michael and I first met in 2007. We got to know each other over beer and live music, both from the other side of the world, Germany and Greece, both passionate about travel and both very fond of live music. Michael especially with his ever-growing collection of band t-shirts. And these shirts always triggered some interesting conversations. In 2010, we decided to move in together, and up till then, nothing indicated a change. But unfortunately, Michael became very sick with atrial fibrillation, and he stayed at home for four months to recover. No, he was on long service leave or sick leave he had accumulated. He was reluctant to go back to work. His position as director of research and communication at the parliamentary library was rather stressful. He seemed depressed and not motivated and needed a lot of encouragement to go back to work. So, to make him feel better, we started to organize a trip to Europe and we traveled in 2012. Michael seemed to feel better. We were both still working full time. In 2013, after we came home from a trip to New Zealand, Michael received his work performance appraisal which was rather negative. A decline in executive function was evident. Michael did not take the result very well and he resigned the position he had held and loved for many years and was so popular for. He left without any farewell. This came as a shock to me as we had planned to work full time until 2015 and Michael then 65 might retire and I would reduce my working hours to make time for more travels. Michael did not enjoy being retired and did not know what to do with all this spare time. He read a lot of history books, listened to his favorite music, started building with nano blocks and collected tin soldiers. He still had his driving license and was able to drive to West End to meet his friends. I continued to work full time, but noticing that Michael slept till at least 11, waking up only to watch TV and sitting on the couch upset me. Obsessively watching the news, ABC, SBS, CNN and whatever seemed understandable as he worked for politicians all his life and wanted to stay informed. But the inability to occupy his time any other way had me concerned. I changed my working hours to part-time to have more time with him. So I endeavored to get us out of the house and I organized another trip to Europe in 2015. Planning a trip together was the best part of it. This gave us a purpose and we did something fun together. And also we had something exciting to look forward to. Michael was in a good mood and could not wait to get away. But during this trip, there were some indicators that something wasn't right with Michael. While in Hong Kong, Michael got upset with a monk begging for money. He yelled at him and caused a lot of attention. In Greece, it was the old lady who was trying to sell us a tablecloth. She was very pushy, which again upset Michael and he started to get very angry. The lady's daughter was watching us and interfered, yelling at us in return. Back home, there were more psychotic episodes, nightly screaming, pacing up and down the hallway, swearing, yelling, wanting to kill some people. 
He always became upset when he saw ladies wearing the hijab or people with tattoos, anyone com coming to the house, door knocking. He was not able to control his rage or to discuss matters clearly. He often imagined things that did not happen. This behavior confused and upset me greatly. The one gentle and kind man I knew was turning into the opposite. My two grown daughters watched on as I attempted to deflect his attention during the ep these episodes. None of us knew how to calm him down other than to let him yell until he was done. Things never led to serious physical altercations, but his voice definitely made it feel like it could. We learned not to talk back. I had to learn to be careful in whatever I would discuss with Michael, not to tell him about any problems I was having. In 2016, finally, we heard that one of his cousins, a lady in her 70s, was admitted to a nursing home, diagnosed with Huntington's disease. Nobody in Michael's close family knew about it, or at least had never talked about it. His father died when he was 65 and had no obvious symptoms. And only it was mentioned once that one uncle had the shakes. As soon as we heard about his cousin, we went to Michael GP and uh, received a referral to the Huntington clinics. Michael tested positive, he was 66 years old. It was a great relief for me to finally know what he had, a clinical reason for this change in behavior. It wasn't personal, but for Michael it was quite a shock. And then Michael received all the specialist treatments. We had a very supportive healthcare team. The Huntington's Clinic, the Huntington Support Group, the neurologist, psychiatrist, psychologist, speech pathologist, physiotherapist, and so on. Michael GP was outstanding. I could discuss with him all the changes in Michael and he would find a way to help. We both signed up for the gym and went twice a week. Michael had the support of a personal trainer, helping him to improve balance and muscle strength. And he enjoyed the gym very much and made a few friends. The hunting and support meetings were also a great help. Organizing Michael's life, the appointments, going out to live music, theater, cinema, meeting friends and working part-time helped keeping things moving. We enjoyed doing fun things together, and being busy kept me happy. As a per practical and proactive person, enjoying a routine and working in aged care provided the foundation to keep us going in this time of transition and gradual decline. I made sure to learn as much as I could about this disease and applying it to our life. In 2017, we traveled again to Europe, Apart from the Rolling Stones gig, we visited a lot of family and friends. Oh, it's so hard to read. I decided to stop working mid-2018 and, and uh, to travel again to Europe. Again, Rolling Stones and Eric Clapton gigs and family and sightseeing. This was a difficult journey and I realized that this was the last time we could go overseas. Michael's mobility was declining rapidly and when back in Australia, we decided to buy a foldable power chair. As it was rather heavy, we also installed a hoist in our station wagon. The power chair kept us mobile and we still could attend music festivals. But it was another thing to consider when going out. I started planning our outings around the accessibility of the venue. Where can we park? How easy are the walkways? Are there any stairs? Is there room for the chair? How long will it take to get from door to door? A few extra details, but it was de I was determined to continue our routine, sharing our love for live entertainment. We even undertook a road trip to Sydney in 2019. Michael had handed in his license some time ago, but I enjoyed the trip in the car and sightseeing. And then 2020 came, and with it, COVID. 
As we could not travel overseas, I organized a helicopter ride over Brisbane for Michael's 70th birthday. We also installed a stair lift in our house as Michael could not manage the stairs anymore. The COVID years, occasionally lockdowns, immunization, social distancing were not a problem. Staying home, daily nature walks, visiting friends in our bubble and some live music continued our routine. Michael needed more help now with showering, getting dressed, different food, and he appeared to be more withdrawn, but was always interested in going out. What are we doing today, was a question. For me as a carer, the COVID time was rather easy as we could not go on big trips. I did not need to organize so many outings. But daily walks were a must, and after we would sit in our garden enjoying the flowers and a beer, the cat keeping us company. On reflection, I wonder if a brain scan earlier would have changed Michael's treatment. Would we have asked him to do all these exercises, walking every day, standing up earlier? What else could I have done to make his life more enjoyable and easier? Sadly, Michael died on the 20th, sorry, on the 22nd of March after massive bleeding on the brain. His passing was sudden but also peaceful. A blessing for him, a great loss for us. Sorry.